Good evening. Welcome to Hard Fire. I'm Ronald Wick, and I'm happy to bring you another show devoted to the events of 9-11-2001. My guest should be familiar to those of you who've watched our debates over the past year. He's Mark Roberts, the bunker extraordinaire. He's the man who has an encyclopedic knowledge of uh, all matters relating to that terrible day. So we're going to talk to Mark tonight about a few very specific issues. Uh, primarily, we're going to be discussing the uh, testimonies of first responders, people who were on the scene while the attacks were underway, who were there uh, physically removing uh, victims from the, from the buildings, people who saw the buildings collapse, people who were covered with blood and dust and grime. Uh, Mark, tell us just uh, by way of introduction, what got you started in the debunking business? Well, the CIA, of course, they pay me to do all of this. Uh, <laughs> uh, I get accused of that a lot. I am yeah. actually a tour guide in mm -hmm. New York City. Um, didn't have any particular interest in conspiracy theories uh, prior to this. Uh, signed up at a little website, uh, the uh, forum of the James Randi Educational Foundation. And uh, it's, a, it's a site for uh, critical thinkers and, and uh, people who like science and, and uh, rational thought. And um, uh, very quickly after I signed up, someone posted a link to this film called Loose Change and said, has anyone seen this thing? It's driving me crazy. I think it's, uh, it's really very inaccurate, and that's putting it mildly. Uh, and I had never heard of this before. And uh, so watched the film. Actually, didn't watch the film first. First, I signed up at their at their uh, forum that they had uh, discussion forum on the mm -hmm. internet for loose change, and um, uh, because I wanted to know why they were making these outrageous claims about 9/11 that it was actually a conspiracy, it wasn't the work of of uh, Islamic extremist terrorists. Uh, some some people were claiming that planes didn't even hit the World Trade Center towers. I'm a New Yorker. I wasn't in New York on 9/11. Uh, but I know lots of people who saw those planes hit the towers with their own eyes from close up. And uh, that was shocking to me because as a tour guide, I'm at the World Trade Center site a lot. And uh, in fact, prior to that, I had been there almost every single day for five months. No one had ever asked me about one of these conspiracy theories. None of my friends had ever heard of these conspiracy theories. But apparently, th things were really spreading on the Internet. And uh, some of the things that uh, people told me uh, when I was first conversing with them online and just trying to get information. Uh, what, do you, what do you mean the buildings were, were destroyed by controlled demolitions with explosives in them? Uh, how could that be done? How could that work have survived? How could, it, how could it remain undetected? How come no one has ever been caught or confessed to anything like that? No one had any answers. And what did you use for sources? I'm assuming this is before the Popular Mechanics book came out. You hadn't yet read the NIST report. Yeah, or? before I knew any, I didn't know anything. I knew uh, quite a bit about the, the buildings themselves at the World Trade Center mm -hmm. um, uh, because it's part of my job. Um, and but uh, but just on the internet, what I would be doing is someone would make a claim while I'm chatting with them on this on this group of uh, of people who were uh, opposed to the official version of events and think it was all a big conspiracy. They would make a claim and uh, I would immediately look it up because I'd never heard that before and I don't mm -hmm. know the melting temperature of steel, I don't, you know. Uh, and what I found was within a minute or two I could find the answer to almost every question from a reliable source mm -hmm. uh, that this is that was not mysteries uh, and, and knocking those down one after another after another. So what happens then is their claims get more complex and they dig, try to dig deeper and deeper to get more and more obscure facts and things like that. That's how I got drawn into it. Uh, it wasn't anything I intended to do, uh, but I found a lot of the things that they were saying extremely offensive, especially about victims. Uh, and these are some of the people who were running the forum, not just people who were, who were posting there. Uh, and that really got me ticked off. Uh, so I heard that Dylan Avery, was, who was the creator of Loose Change, um, and his crew were coming to New York on April 25th of 2006 to protest at the opening of the movie United 93, premiere of the movie. Um, and uh, they weren't going to watch it, they were just going to protest because they said that's all a, a lie, that there weren't heroic passengers on that plane who tried to storm the cockpit and the plane didn't crash in, 
Pennsylvania. And that's in his movie, A Loose Change. Just, just as an aside, uh, Flight 93 has, has always puzzled me a little bit. Uh, the plane was brought down by the actions of heroic passengers. That is uh, the official story. Now, the conspiracists would have us believe that it was shot down. What I find so hard to understand, shouldn't the Air Force have shot the plane down? In, in, in other words, if the Air Force doesn't shoot the plane down, they're wrong and it's a conspiracy. If they do shoot the plane down, they're wrong and it's a conspiracy, you know? I mean, yeah, precisely. Uh, uh, the, you can't win there, and that's the case with most of their claims, is yeah. that is that uh, they're not falsifiable. Um, mm. And uh, in that case, uh, though, in the movie Loose Change, they were claiming that the plane didn't even crash. In the first version of the film, they said, yes, the plane crashed in, in uh, Pennsylvania, was probably shot down. Oh, the other, they went back to Cleveland? In the second yeah. version, yeah. they threw that away, and they introduced this theory that the plane actually landed in Cleveland, um, and that Presumably, someone came along and scattered debris and, and human remains and all of that, which was positively identified as coming from United 93 in Pennsylvania. That's an extraordinary claim to make. So they were saying things like that. They were also saying that uh, the passengers didn't even exist. You know, these people have families. Um, and that stuff just offended me. So it's a sense of anger ever since then that they persist in these theories that are so obviously wrong and that are so indefensible and that are so not supported by even on the most basic level by logic uh, but once you get into the particulars of it or get into the science of it not supported by that either well we're just finding out from uh, uh, dr. George Popkin who is uh, has been described as the father of voice morphing technology that uh, such technology is in its infancy and in fact, there would have been no way of creating conversations. Yeah, you're uh, referring to the claim that, that uh, the many phone calls that were made from the planes were on, somehow on, fake. On Flight 93 yeah. in, in particular, uh, but, but uh, on all the flights, but Flight 93 in particular, that these people talk to their families often. Yes. Um, and uh, that somehow in real time, all of those people's voices were faked. In one case, a woman gave the combination to her safe at home. It's so remarkable because Popkin says not only didn't this technology exist in 2001, it doesn't exist now, it won't exist. And this, is the, you, this is the creator of the technology. Yeah, yeah well, yeah. Of, of course, he's in on it. Uh, right, so <laughs> yeah. he, he must be a conspirator also. Yeah. And, uh, but that kind of thing is so pernicious. You're saying that the last words that we know of, of these family members, didn't exist. It was all faked. Who knows yeah. what happened to those passengers? There's a technology that could fool a mother into thinking she's yeah. talking to and, her son. And, yeah. and you know, others say, well, they couldn't have made those calls from cell phones. Well, only a couple of calls were made from cell phones mm -hmm. anyway. Um, some of the leading lights of the 9-11 truth movement, I use scare quotes, and I don't re often do that. Um, but truth is the last thing that these people are concerned about. Some of the leading people there are still making these claims. They're, st they're saying that um, David Ray Griffin is uh, someone that has sold a lot of books on this subject mm. um, in which I can't recall anything that he gets right, nor can anyone else that I talk to who claim that his books are great recall uh, can tell me anything that he gets right. Um, but he had a, a, an article up on the Pilots for Truth website. They call mm. themselves professionals. We're, we're doing this professionally and we really know what we're doing. We're pilots and we're for the truth. And uh, his claim was that, that um, on Flight 77, Barbara Olson, wife of uh, Solicitor General Ted Olson, mm -hmm. made a phone call, a couple, a few phone calls. That couldn't have happened. Yeah, said. the air phones and, had and been the, removed. And, the, and yeah. the idea was that you need a credit card to make that call. Mm -hmm. And uh, she didn't use a credit card. And so they, they send you to a, a link um, to the American Airlines website that describes how to use their phones on, on uh, the seat, back of the seats. They don't have them anymore, but they used to. And it says, oh, yes, and they say, see, you have to dial out, uh, dial this code and dial the country code mm -hmm. to get out. Directly below that, it tells you how to dial the operator. Yeah. Toll free, and it says toll free. Yeah. Right? Directly below, on the same page, right, uh, the information that they're saying doesn't exist is printed right there. And so the leading light of the 9-11 truth movement is saying that this stuff is impossible, and it's in print.
on the literature they, that he's referring you to, and not only that, it's the wrong phone system anyway that they were referring you to. But yeah, they claim they, that the air phones had been removed from American Airlines 757s, and I managed to reach uh, John Hotar, who is the uh, media representative for the airline, and he said, no, no, the confusion uh, can be cleared up. Uh, there was an order to remove the phones. The phones, for the most part, were not removed until 2002, and in fact, there is no existing work order to remove the phones from Flight 77. Sure, yeah, know. March 2002. That was yeah. great work on your part. There's, there's some things that I don't have the patience for, really. You've got to make I, a lot of phone calls. Y y exactly. <laughs> you know, and, and you have to wait for people to call you back. Yeah, and sometimes and they do and sometimes they don't. That's one of them that I yeah. find so absurd, but to actually get something hard on that from the people at American, which is what they should be doing. They should be doing that research. They should find that engineering they change order. They won't do the most basic research. They won't do uh, the most basic research. I, I, I don't want to get sidetracked on issues that we could talk about for hours. What I wanted to establish for the viewers is that as a tour guide, you're quite familiar with the World Trade Center complex. I mean, these, these buildings, sites that you've gone through several times. In other words, you, you know the layout of the place, you know uh, how they were constructed, you know where the elevators were. I mean, this is... Uh, yeah, I only started uh, tour guiding after 2001, yeah. um, but I'd been in the buildings quite a few times prior to that. I used to go up regularly to the observation yeah. deck uh, and, uh, and been visiting people in offices there. Uh, but since then, I've become much more familiar with it because it's, it is part of my job to know about yeah. that building and all the buildings around it. Now, you've just written a paper uh, dealing with um, a firefighter named uh, John Schroeder. And uh, Schroeder was interviewed by Dylan Avery of the Loose Change team. Uh, in that interview, Schroeder committed himself to... Um, statements that seem to support the conspiracist view that explosives were used in the World Trade Center. Now, we, we understand this man is a hero. There's, there's no disputing that. Sure. He, he, you know, he was, he was there. He saw some of his, his, uh, his brothers uh, killed when the buildings collapsed. I mean, there's, there's no way uh, that anyone wants to denigrate this man's activities on that, that terrible day. Not at all. What we're going to try to uh, convey in the course of this discussion is that someone who's on the scene in a chaotic event is not necessarily the best person to describe the overall picture of what's happening. Yeah, and this is something that I brought up uh, back in May. I, I brought out a paper on William Rodriguez who, who and his claims, who we'll talk about in a few minutes. Um, a lot of that has to do with the, the confusion, the fog of war that these people went through and uh, and also uh, suffering from from maybe symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder I don't know I'm not understandable a, I'm not a, enough I mean absolutely uh, you know. uh, but but what you see uh, ac almost across the board uh, with people who were right there when the towers were hit and were collapsing um, there's a tremendous amount of confusion about what was going on these were unprecedented events um, information was very difficult to get often um, a lot of the radios weren't working for the, for the fire department in particular, weren't working properly. Uh, so a lot of people had no idea what was actually happening around them. Um, in John Schroeder's case, he was, uh, came in, uh, he was working at Engine Company 5, which is right across the street from the World Trade Center. And um, uh, they made it to the building very quickly, obviously, uh, got into the building. At that time, some chiefs were arriving. They waited for their assignment to go up the stairs and uh, knew that a plane had hit. That's about all they knew. Didn't know what size it was. Didn't really know even exactly where the fire uh, was worst. Uh, but Schroeder describes about 30 stories of fire coming out of, the, uh, out of the top. No one had ever seen anything like that. And there were reports of multiple planes hitting the building. That came that? later. That yeah. came later. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, first thing he sees is a man in the street who is, who is terribly burned. How could that? And he's alive. How could that have happened? He didn't fall from the, from the building or the plane, obviously. Um, and uh, what had happened was that uh, when the planes hit, uh, they dispersed a lot of fuel. People know the pictures of the fireballs very well. Uh, but what a lot of people don't know is that most of that fuel was not burned off in those, in those fireballs. Um, a lot of it stayed in the building, 
fueling the fires, the subsequent fires, and quite a bit of it went down the elevator shafts also. There were elevator shafts that went all the way from the impact zones all the way down to the sub-basement levels. Now, just to be clear, ground. when you say the fuel went down the elevator shafts, it's in liquid form. It's, yeah. It's pour, literally pouring down the elevator shaft. Yeah, shafts. and right. depending on which shaft it's going down, depending on when it's pouring down, some floors it would burst out, blow out elevators on certain floors. People were in some of those elevators and described that experience. People blinded by jet fuel, inhaling jet fuel. It smells like kerosene, so it's a very, a very mm -hmm. distinctive thing. Uh, so that happened, uh, but uh, people who were arriving on the scene didn't know that it happened. Uh, one of Schroeder's uh, partners on, in the engine uh, helped extinguish the guy who was in the street, asked a security uh, guy there what had happened. He said a fireball came out of, the, out of the elevator shafts, blew out the windows, set a bunch of people on is fire in the lobby. Is this the same fireball that uh, William Rodriguez is talking about? It is, yeah. It it is. This is the north tower of the world, the first one to be hit. So Schroeder and Rodriguez, Rodriguez are describing the same phenomenon. Right. William Rodriguez was uh, just a, one, a, a few levels below that, in the first sub-basement, which is two levels below ground, really, uh, below the uh, lobby level. Um, so describing the same event, but again, confusing. They didn't know, Schroeder hadn't heard that story, that that's what happened. So he walks into the lobby, sees a lot of people burned, uh, the windows are blown out, doesn't know what had happened, uh, gets their order to go upstairs. As they're starting to go up the stairs, uh, he, here's another big explosion, uh, believes that one of the elevators has, has, has fallen, and apparently it did. Uh, that happened quite a few times. Elevators were dropping in the towers. Uh, said he saw people burned there, uh, coming out of the out of the elevators. Um, not sh quite sure if that did happen. What we know happened th at that time, though, at exactly that time, is that Flight 175 hit the South Tower, uh, caused a huge fireball there, uh, caused lots of effects on the ground. People were on fire on the ground. Now, uh, here I, I don't mean to interrupt you, but this is this is the point that a number of people uh, express. Uh, certain confusion about. Uh, William Rodriguez talks about hearing an explosion prior to the impact of the plane on Let's the building. Let's get to that in a, when, we, when we do get a little bit more in depth with okay, Rodriguez. Yeah, maybe. because I think this is a, this is a confusing issue for, it for is many confusing. people. It is confusing. A lot of people don't understand, and in my Rodriguez paper I go into great depth about how that happened and physically why that could happen in those buildings. Okay. But I don't want to confuse people about whose who's story we're telling here. Yeah, but they, um, they kind of dovetail together. They right? do very much dovetail together. They're, the confusion in their chronologies dovetails together quite a bit. Um, and, and Schroeder I have to apologize to because I just came out with this paper yesterday, and he's had no chance to respond to it. He's apparently on vacation right now. We would love to sit down and talk with him in a venue like this or any venue. I, I uh, should make the point that I, I uh, haven't been able to reach John Schroeder. He's certainly uh, more than welcome to appear uh, on Hard Fire and discuss this uh, subject with us. Uh, I've invited William Rodriguez. He has declined to appear. He's uh, invitation stands. Uh, you know, it's always a little bit embarrassing to, in effect, debate the empty chair. That's, I'd rather not. I'd rather, it's not our choice. I'd, I'd rather you know, hear, or we hear would, these We would prefer to have them here. Sure. Uh, um, and, and again, with, with John Schroeder's account, I'm not making any accusations. What I'm saying is that here's a guy who tells us that he was very confused, is very confused about what happened. Um, and uh, so here's this sort of explosion um, in the lobby level before they're about to, to go up the stairs. Starts marching up those stairs, exhausting, exhausting work. Thousands of people are coming down. Um, uh, so they're trying to fight their way up the stairs. These guys have over 100 pounds of gear on and uh, uh, make it up eventually to the 23rd floor. And at that time, they hear a huge boom. Uh, just prior to that, they had heard a warning over the radio that there might be planes coming in, incoming, and more planes coming in. On 9-11, there were quite a few false alarms about uh, potential aircraft coming into New York and to Washington, other cities yeah. also. I mean, we were hearing that on television. Oh, sure. Yeah. And, um, and so they hear that warning, and then shortly after that, there's a huge boom. The whole building shakes. Lighting fixtures are coming down. Uh, now, what Schroeder thinks had happened at that time was that Flight 175 hit the South Tower, just about 150 feet away at that time. Uh, but that had actually happened uh, 56 minutes earlier. Uh, so his chronology was off by that much, and that's common. 
Is he hearing the collapse of the South? He's hearing the collapse and feeling the collapse okay. of the South Tower, which blew out windows in the North Tower, shook the building tremendously, which Flight 175, when it hit the South Tower, that didn't happen. There was Some people felt it. A lot of people never even felt it in the North Tower. They, so they now had no why idea. Why six years after the fact does he not appreciate this? I mean, why does he not know that the South Tower collapsed? Um, I don't know. That's what I'd like to talk to him about. Uh, but not knowing that at the time was almost universal. Yeah. People who were in the building almost universally did not know that the South Tower had collapsed completely when they were in the building. So what happens is they get the evacuation order. Some of them didn't need to be given. It was terrifying what had happened. So they start working their way back down the stairs and it takes about another half hour to get down, down the stairs and sees the lobby that he had just come up out of devastated. Uh, had, still has no idea what had happened, didn't know that the South Tower had collapsed. Uh, so in his mind, something else had done that devastation. He thinks an explosive. Uh, right, and, uh, 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 and, and then goes outside. Outside is devastated also. Now, is uh, that the same thing that William Rodriguez is doing? Uh, to an extent. Um, what I do in my paper on Schroeder is present a tremendous amount of eyewitness accounts of people who he was with. Uh, people who were interviewed, uh, firefighters who were interviewed after the fact, who describe exactly what was happening at these times. Uh, so we know for a fact that Flight 175 hit the South Tower when he was in the lobby, that the explosion that he thinks had happened was not referred to by anyone else down there at that time, although a falling elevator was. We know that the South Tower collapsed when he was on the 23rd floor. Uh, but yes, in 2007, he still doesn't know that. And so uh, what he thought had happened, he got just barely got out of the out of the North Tower before it collapsed, as William Rodriguez did, uh, and started heading west towards the water. Uh, the tower is collapsing behind him. Everyone's seen the huge cloud of debris and and uh, and dust coming at them. Uh, makes it to the water, uh, still then thinks, and, and is actually this is how terrifying it is. Was thinking about uh, stripping. They were stripping off their gear. They're going to jump in the in the river and swim to New Jersey. Firefighters. These are guys who are tough. Yeah, they're used yeah. to emergencies, they're used to life and death situations, they throw themselves into the maw of it all the time. Uh, that's how terrifying things well, were. Well, it was like I, being in a war zone. Very, very sure. hard for anybody who's never been through that to relate to. I can't relate to it except through the accounts mm -hmm. I've read from people who were there. Um, but then he's turned around and he thought he saw the North Tower collapse. And then he was working his way up North End Avenue um, and thought he saw the South Tower collapse after that. So that's how confusing things were. Mm -hmm. There were people there who were on the scene for hours afterwards who did not know that both towers had collapsed fully because there was so much smoke and, uh, and confusion going on. Um, there were people who thought that three planes had hit the buildings. There were people who thought that everything was done by bombs, had no idea that planes had hit the buildings even. Well, again, the, uh, so many of these uh, first responder uh, uh, quotes uh, allude to explosions. Now. We know that explosions don't imply explosives, but in such extensive fires, wouldn't we expect things to be blowing up? In, in every extensive fire like that, something's going to blow up. Uh, and uh, you've got things happening, enormous events happening, that, uh, that uh, floors are partially collapsing within the building. Mm -hmm. um, you've got reports of that, all sorts of flammable stuff in there that can blow up. After the fact, you've got lots of reports of things like uh, cars mm -hmm. on fire and their gas tanks and the, the air packs that the firefighters used blowing up. In the few minutes we have left, um, I'd, I'd like you to just talk about William Rodriguez briefly because he was a hero that day. He, he saved several lives. Sure. Uh, and he has been um, extremely critical of the government. Sure. And he has been uh, vigorously promoting this conspiracy theory that the buildings have blown up. Now, what, what's the main thing that, in your opinion, he's, he's missing? I mean, you, you, you have already pointed out that he, too, shares this idea that something blew up, blew out the glass in the lobby. He's not aware of the fact that the South Tower is collapsing while he's moving up and down. Uh, very, very different story from John Schroeder. What upsets me about John Schroeder's story uh, is both that no one has corrected him about these things over the years, and it's led him to believe that some other effects caused the, this devastation that he viewed, mm -hmm. and that some unscrupulous people like Dylan Avery have taken advantage of that confusion. Mm -hmm. So that's what I hope to correct with him. 
William Rodriguez is very different. Um, he's really promoting his own story. Uh, I'm not. I think that's his only job. Has as far he changed as I know. his story? He's changed his story tremendously. When he first came out with that story, uh, he described the jet fuel uh, fireball coming down the elevator shafts. And uh, it was only after a period of a couple of years that, uh, that he changed the story to saying that he thinks it's bombs that did that. Uh, he even testified or, or gave uh, a, a talk to NIST, who were responsible for determining why the towers collapsed, and uh, never mentioned that, never mentioned that he thought that bombs were involved. It was, it's a political decision that he made, that he tells us that he made. Uh, that happened a couple of years afterwards. He was upset that the 9-11 Commission wasn't including family members hmm. of victims. Uh, and his, his whole uh, approach took a very, very different turn. Uh, I've demonstrated that he gets almost everything wrong, some of it not, not so much his fault because he's, he's under the, the same uh, temporal confusion when things happened. Uh, but since he's out there promoting his story, he travels the world and does this now. Uh, speaks to Muslim groups and the Muslim countries who get who can get sometimes a bit riled up about this and says that the U.S. government did this. He's playing on his role as a hero, uh, yeah. and he is a hero. Uh, but but his actions since then have have not been heroic in terms of of the work he's done to figure out what really happened. One one thing struck me uh, your your comment in your paper on Rodriguez. Uh, he's talking about the block of uh, twenty one stories that's falling. And something arrests the fall. Uh, this is this is impossible. Why, yeah. why isn't well, he aware? What had of happened it? was, and this is something that a lot of people experienced, um, was that uh, there was a radio call that the 50, 65th floor was collapsing. Mm -hmm. um, it didn't collapse. Uh, Rodriguez thought that when the South Tower was collapsing, when he was in the building, that uh, that was actually 21 floors of the North Tower collapsing that he was in, which obviously didn't happen. That's something he mm -hmm. should know. I would love to keep you here all night. In fact, I've got you here. Uh, we are taping this prior to our live call-in show that uh, will be seen before this one. So once again, we thank you for joining us on uh, Hard Fire. We look forward to uh, seeing you again, and we hope to bring you further discussions of that terrible day, September 11th, 2001. Again, we welcome the participation of uh, the conspiracists who disagree strongly with the stance we take. Again, it's been our pleasure. Have a, have a good night, and we hope to see you soon. Hard Fire is funded in part by the Libertarian Party of New York. Catering for the cast and crew of Hard Fire is generously provided by Da Vincenzo Restaurant, 256 Prospect Park West, Brooklyn, New York, 11215. 718-369-3590 www.davincenzorestaurant.com